Good. Okay. Good evening. It's uh, approximately 6.30. Uh, welcome to the Thursday, June 23rd meeting of the Zoning Board of Examiners and Appeals. Um, this meeting is now called to order. Will you call the roll, please? Timoth Timothy Big. Here. Dean Cars. Here. Jeff Braun. Here. Joshua Fink. Present. Ann Denny. Here. Kate Williams. Here. Dale Patrick. Here. Very well. We have a quorum. A fully constituted board of uh, is nine members. We have seven members currently appointed to the board, and all seven members are here this evening. A quorum, of course, being five members to the board. Um, for those of you who didn't grab one on the way in but would like to, there are hard copies of the agendas and also the three cases we'll be hearing this evening in the lobby if you'd like to follow along. Um, agenda item B, minutes, we have none for approval. Um, item C, special orders of business executive sessions. Are there any disclosures this evening? Seeing none, moving on. Agenda item D, uh, I don't believe there's anything on the consent agenda, no resolutions for approval. Moving on, appearance requests. Are there any appearance requests? No? Okay. No unfinished business either. Uh, takes us to the regular agenda, resolutions for approval. I don't believe we have any of those either. Okay. Agenda item H, public hearings. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to uh, read the order of business for public hearings. Um, the chair shall introduce the variance and explain the procedure to be followed. The variance, case number, and the name of the applicant shall be read into the record. The board shall hear and rule on any objections to sufficiency of notice. The board shall hear a brief staff presentation outlining the variance, not to exceed 10 minutes. On conclusion of the staff presentation, the board members and the applicant may then direct questions to the staff through the chair. The applicant shall give his or her presentation, again, not to exceed 10 minutes. Throughout the proceedings, the burden of proof rests upon the applicant, who must convince the board by a preponderance of the evidence that the variance should be granted. On conclusion of the applicant's presentation, the board members and the staff may then direct questions to the applicant, again through the chair. The hearing shall then be open for public testimony. Each member of the public has three minutes. All persons who testify may be questioned by the board, the staff, or the applicant. On conclusion of the public testimony, the staff, followed by the applicant, shall have the right of rebuttal, three minutes each. The board shall proceed to, to develop oral findings and conclusions with regard to the variance and disposition of the variance. Staff shall reduce the oral findings and conclusions to writing for subsequent ad adoption by the board at a later meeting. The matter then rests with the board, and the chair asks for a positive motion from the board. Takes us to our first case. Case number 2011-050. Is the petitioner, Mr. Schuster, present? If so, please indicate. Mr. Schuster has indicated he is present. All right. Uh, will staff please provide sufficiency of notice? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we jump in, allow me to introduce the person on my left, Margaret O'Brien. Ms. O'Brien has been with the department for 27 years. But Ms. O'Brien has generally been doing platting uh, in, in the recent time period, uh, he's branching out. Thank you. Very good. Uh, for this case, Mr. Chairman, 41 public hearing notices were mailed out. We received seven responses in support of the application, five in opposition, no comments from the Community Council, and the property was properly posted and advertised. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Please proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a variance for lot dimension to allow an existing duplex on an R9, one and a quarter acre lot um, to continue to exist where the lot is only large enough to allow a single family unit. Uh, 3.75 acres are necessary for uh, a duplex in R9, and the property is an acre and a quarter. There is an as built on page two. Aerials of the surrounding neighborhood and some photographs, pages 14 through 19, and a permit, a copy of the permit and the plot plan uh, for the structure, pages 48 through 55. I'll be making occasional reference to those. 
Uh, the subject property was subdivided by deed in the 1960s. This specific property dates to July 1965, and there is a warranty deed conveying the property to Mr. Schuster in 1972. Zoning did not occur until 1974. In 1966, there was a property appraisal record indicating a structure on site, but that is not the current structure as far as we can tell. 1966, a building permit was, uh, excuse me, a land use permit was located for a two-level single-family home for the property. Uh, the subject property is a substandard R9 lot size, but it was platted before zoning was enacted. Again, the minimum lot size for R9 is 2.5 acres, and that allows a single-family unit. Three and three-quarter acres are needed for a duplex. In 1996, the applicant obtained a permit for a single-family home. During the construction, he decided to convert the unit into a duplex instead of single-family. The building permit, excuse me, the land use permit should have been amended, but was not. Into the standards, number one, there exist exceptional or extraordinary physical circumstances, and such circumstances are not applicable to other land in the same district. The standard is not substantially met. There are no unusual physical features directly related to the need for this variance. The application states that overall slope in the property is 11 percent, and that appears to be typical for the area. The application further states the lot has good soils, no wetlands, and that the entire lot is essentially buildable. Regardless, none of these issues are directly related to the need for the variance, and it's, this is a common situation throughout the neighborhood. In this case, the lot is simply too small to allow a duplex. The lot's rectangular in shape and size, uh, excuse me, the lot is similar in shape and size to other lots in the neighborhood. It was subdivided prior to zoning. However, apparently most of the other lots were too, as they all seem to have the same non-conforming characteristics for R9 properties, and that is um, two and a half acres. Uh, they seem to lack the characteristic requirement for the R9 lots. There is an issue with this property in that the property is cut in half by an unplatted travel, tra, excuse me, travel way labeled Sunshine Loop. It serves the subject property and other properties in the area. However, if you look at the aerial photographs, you will see this is a common feature in the neighborhood in Glen Alps, prop, uh, excuse me, rights of way, travel ways running across properties. And further, these are man-made features. They're not a natural physical circumstance of the land. Standard two, because of the physical circumstances, strict application of the code would create an exceptional hardship and deprive the applicant of common rights of enjoyment. The standard is not substantially met. Because of the small lot size, Title 21 would limit construction on the property to a single family home. And that would be similar to other structures in the neighborhood. This building, this uh, dwelling, pair of dwelling units is a total of 1,800 square feet and appears similar in size to other homes in the R9 neighborhood. As mentioned, many of the uh, other lots have travel ways cutting across them and no other duplexes were noted in the neighborhood. Under the terms of the code, the owner is not being deprived of the common rights of enjoyment. Standard three, the hardship is not self-imposed. The standard is not substantially met. There are physical issues throughout the Glen Alps area, but nothing unique to this property. The need for the variance is a result of the actions of the applicant. The applicant made and had an approved single-family permit in 1996. It was not amended. There was no change order to convert the unit to a duplex. The applicant also owns and has owned other properties in the area. One of his properties has a setback variance on it. The applicant is or should have been aware of some of the land use regulations uh, and how it would affect uh, this structure. The permit papers do indicate the applicant was building a new single family home and the conversion, took, the conversion to a duplex took place during this construction without amending the permit. Standard number four, the standard is at least partially met that there is no negative effect on uh, adjacent properties. Um, no drainage, building separation issues have been identified. 
as a duplex, however, and the reason the standard is only partially met is that as a duplex, the property has superior rights to other properties in the neighborhood as everything else is single family. The case does result from a neighborhood complaint. Standard five, the variance if granted is in keeping with the intent of the code. The standard is partially met. The request is dimensional. It's not a use variance as duplex are, are, duplexes are allowed. You just need three and three quarter acres. As the only duplex in the neighborhood, it doesn't stand out and there is no apparent negative impact to the neighborhood. We do not consider an approved variance to set a precedent. However, with the other properties in the neighborhood having the same physical characteristics of the land, if this should become an area of duplexes, the characteristics of the neighborhood would be changed. Standard six, the variance, if granted, does not adversely affect the health, safety, and welfare. Again, as in standard four, this is at least partially met. The property is short about 109,000 square feet to allow a duplex, which is why the standard is only partially met. And standard seven, the variance, if granted, is the minimum variance to make reasonable to make possible a reasonable use of the land. That standard is not substantially met. A reasonable use is for single family home as exists throughout the neighborhood. And as I mentioned, the normal size for an R9 lot is two and a half acres. And excuse me, the normal, the lot is short, the normal size for an R9 property. Um, if the lot were short only a few hundred square feet, it might be possible to consider this a minimal variance, but the lot is short, approximately two and a half acres required for a duplex. Because of several of the standards are not substantially met, the department recommends denial. Should the board find for approval, we have five conditions on page 12 of the report. All five standards are, excuse me, all five conditions are needed if um, the application is approved. If the application is denied, standard five, uh, excuse me, condition five is the one that is needed uh, because we need to get a, a closeout inspection for the property uh, from the 1996 uh, permit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Uh, does the board have any questions for staff? Mr. Cars. Yes, um, Mr. Barrett, um, the, the statement in the staff write-up that in 1996 um, the applicant obtained a permit for a single-family home, if they had requested a, an application for a duplex at that st time, the variance would still be necessary, correct? Excuse me, the variance would still be necessary and the permit would not have been issued until one was obtained. So just by applying for a permit for a duplex does not necessarily mean that, that the permit would be issued um, until the variance is re issue is resolved, correct? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Cars, that's correct. The permit reviewer would have seen that the lot was short uh, in area to allow a duplex. Thank you. And then a uh, second question. There were a couple of comments. Um, in the packet regarding the size of the home um, in that, uh, I believe I'm paraphrasing, but it's uh, relatively small as compared to other houses in the area. Um, I, I don't see um, how that affects whether it's a single family or, or a duplex. Um, could you speak to, um, is there anything in the code um, we're talking about dwelling units when we go from a single family home to a, a duplex and nothing um, that speaks to the, the size of the structure. Is that correct in, in the code? Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Cars, um, not, not in that sense. We often use it as a, as a comparison uh, for parity. Is the applicant asking to have something that commonly exists through the neighborhood, which is why we put that in there. In this case, the building by itself is approximately 1,800. Cut that in half for the two units, they're almost identical. So if you look at the two individual units, you could certainly say they're substandard for the neighborhood in terms of square feet. But if you look at the building as a whole, 
the 1,800 square feet, that's comparable for what exists in the neighborhood. Thank you. Any other board members have questions for staff? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Barrett. Would the petitioner please come forward? Mr. Schuster. Please uh, state your name and spell your last name for, for the record. I'm Robert Keen, K-E-A-N, professional land surveyor, 3943S. And I prepared the uh, variance for Mr. Schuster. Start. <laughs> Just a second, Mr. Keene. Um, I'm not sure if it's normally included in the packet or not, or Mr. Barrett, do we need um, confirmation in, in written form from the petitioner? Mr. Chairman, I believe there is a letter in the package from Mr. Schuster authorizing Mr. Keene to be here and speak. I'm looking for it now. But Mr. Schuster's right there, too. Yep, indeed. Uh, pages 32 and 33. There it is. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Keene, uh, you may proceed. You have 10 minutes uh, for your presentation, and please remember that we, um, as the board, need to find upon the seven standards. So if you could speak to those standards, we'd appreciate it. I'd like to start out by uh, going to 2141-10-R9 20, <coughs> residential district, and I'm going to read just part of this. The... Uh, the application of the R9 zoning district most probably in these instances would include lands which have hazards from the standpoint of water recharge areas, steep slopes, wind hazard, marginal soil conditions. In many cases, this zone would be applied to lands which have, without zoning, been developed to these standards. Although the intent of the zone is to establish an average density throughout the area of application which conforms to, to the lot area requirements of said section F, section it is not necessary the intent to establish that density uniformly throughout the area. Uh, throughout the, uh, such areas of application, where proposed development differs from the norm established in the specific requirements of this zone, the planned unit development procedure will be the tool utilized. Of course, we didn't do that. But the intent here is I took the inverse of the, of a lot of the requirements for the R9 by commenting on the, the fact that the 100% of the lot is usable. Whereas in the R9 area, there's a lot of steep slopes, wet, wetlands, other types of uh, physical things that <clears throat> diminish the, the lot size, so there's usually just a small area that's developable. Now this lot, now I'm gonna also read the last couple of uh, on page on 39 of your application, which pretty much sums it up. The subject lot's width is 65 feet, which is 92% of the required minimum lot of 180 feet for both single family and duplex. Furthermore, the subject lot's average slope is 11%, no wetlands. It makes the entire lot usable. His well is 165 feet to bedrock. It's a valuable and attractive feature, uh, 165 feet to bedrock. The gravelly soil and wind hazard are mitigated by the aforementioned grove. There's a grove of hemlock trees on the, on the upward side, upwind side. There are no setback issues, no parking issues, no other violations except a deviation from the permitted use. Whether it's used as single family or duplex, the same density would result due to the, due to the number of bedrooms, which is two. The, the R9 zoning dis, district ratio of the building footprint relative to the lot area of both a duplex and a single family dwelling is 5%. The footprint of the building on the subject lot relative to the lot side I calculated 3.55 percent, which is the which is the actual footprint of it. Substantially less, which is 71 percent of the it's only 71 percent of the maximum ratio allowed in the R9 zone. The subject lot to building footprint ratio conforms to the intent of the zone. 
Considering the size of the allowed lots, the ratio is remarkably small. By many standards, the septic lot and structure thereon conforms to the intent of the zoning district. The septic system and well are designed to work well under maximum capacity with either duplex or single family home. The MOA recognizes the handicap of undersized lots to individuals who own them prior to the existence of the zone and made an effort to bring lots into the zone with all the privileges attached there too. That probably sums up the argument, the position that I took on this, because we, if, if you note throughout the entire explanation that we made no, we, we told it like it was. Now, if you go to, uh, I'm not sure I, whether I can find it this quickly, but uh, the, uh, the regulations that, that apply to non-conforming lots uh, basically state that every attempt will be made to provide these lots the same privileges because they didn't have any input into the zoning. Uh, they're usually areas that have been uh, re, uh, previously subdivided. Uh, he was stuck with the zoning when, it's, when it occurred, and he has to live with what he has. So what we're saying is that width-wise, it's within, within uh, what I say, 91% of the required size, even for a duplex. The lot is long, and much of the lot is not even used. Uh, now, directly going to each of the, to confronting each of the individual uh, standards. Okay, number one, there exists exceptional or extraordinary physical circumstances of the subject property, such as in lot, not limited to streams, wetland slope, and etc. What I'm saying is that the entire lot does, there are no extraordinary physical problems with the lot, all of the lot's good. So it has a lot of area that's useful compared to what is on it. So no, there isn't. It has a lot of attributes is what it has. So I took the inverse of that. Number two, uh, there is one, there's one, I'm gonna add a little, a little bit. There's a little, there's a, a feeling that these roads were self-imposed. The roads are there because of terrain in Glen Alps. You can't just build a road anywhere. They're where a road is, will allow itself to be built to provide access because of slope. So the terrain does affect the positioning of, of items on the lot that do affect the lot. So it isn't entirely uh, a non-environmental or non-topographical feature that the road is where it is. He needs to connect, and that's the way that, that's the way he had to do it, because that because the land is flat across there, and it provided a good basis for the roadway. You could build it on a side slope. Does doesn't is not practical. So access routes were created because of terrain features, and that road was one of them. Um, Number three, uh, the hardship is not self-imposed. Um, we addressed that. It was a idea on Mr. Schuster's part to uh, build a single family dwelling for his kids. It didn't work out. We've all been there. He didn't do it intentionally. Uh, the variance if granted will not adversely affect the use of the adjacent property. Uh, I think everybody admits that it's uh, the house is even smaller than most of them up there. It's very self, very compact, good setback, in intru non-intrusive. Um, and the number of bedrooms limit the size of it. It can't get larger than it is. There's only two bedrooms. Uh, the variance of grad will not adversely affect the use of adjacent property as permitted under this code, no. The variance of granted will not adversely affect the health, safety, and welfare of the people of the municipality of Anchorage. No, in fact, uh, I have an article in here that 
comments on the cost of large houses, the cost of uh, the lack of uh, rental and the lack of uh, places for two, for single people to get started. Uh, sometimes the, uh, a new person up in that area is, will provide fresh blood because people want to live up there or people will like it up there. And uh, even in my own area, which is just below Mr. Schuster, is we have a lot of people trying to live up there and develop, find a way to live up in that area. Uh, number six, the variance if granted will not, uh, excuse me, the variance if granted is a minimum variance that will make it possible the reasonable use of the land. The end product of construction was a very poor single family dwelling. <clears throat> the access to it is through an outside, although enclosed, uh, stairway to the on the east. If you look at the as-built, you'll see it in the pictures. Um, it's not, it doesn't bring together a family. It's, it's separated quite a bit, and there's two kitchens. He took an old building from his other lot, and basically, like we all did, I did it to my own. I could have built out a teak cheaper rack. <laughs> But it, uh, it was a use of an existing structure. Uh, finances do play into this stuff. He had a structure that worked. He put it underneath. When it came out, it, it turned out to be a very poor single family dwelling. <clears throat> um, I'm going to give one minute to Mr. Schuster if he has anything to add to that. That's okay. Or am I have 10 minutes up? Okay. Ooh. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can I ask if Mr. Schuster has any additional comments? Yes, indeed. Please do. Do you have any additional comments, Mr. Schuster? Well, this, the situation was confusing, to say the least. Uh, we were caught in the uh, merger of the city of Glen Alps, which was a regular second-class city, which had its own regulations. Whenever I was starting to build up there, I would get the approval of the Glen Alps City Council. Zoning wasn't in effect yet. We had been assured that uh, our bylaws, we even had bylaws, that they would be upheld, but the municipality rolled right over us and all the, the previous rights that we had and were accustomed to, they disappeared. So we were con con uh, confronted with a new set of rules and uh, it appears that I did not fully inform myself at the time of all of these changes. One in particular, this is a land use area, land use permit area. I had never heard of such a thing as building inspections. We had sewer in, and well inspections, not building inspections. That, well, I don't know where that regulation comes from for land use. Same thing goes for occupancy permits. We had no occupancy permits. The first time I became aware of an occupancy permit was when I slid into this here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schuster. Um, board members have any other questions for the petitioner? Mr. Vig. Um, Mr. Keene, uh, on, on page two of your, well, on this page two of the packet, I'm looking at uh, your site plan of the, of the property and looking at the assumed elevations on a couple of the corners it looks to me that it's much steeper than 11 percent in many areas. For example, along the westerly property line, it looks to be close to 20 percent uh, from the elevation about midway on the on the road that bisects the property. It drops from an elevation of 111.2 down to the corner at 69.5, which is I, I think that is, pro that is probably a, uh, yeah. 
I have a topo map on the other side. That, that might be a typo. Uh, I don't think it goes down that much. Um, there's a uh, topo map, and mine is readable. I can very rapidly check that. you have a question for Mr. Schuster while I look this up? Anybody? <laughs> um, <clears throat> not yet. Well, yeah. We'd be happy to wait. That's, that's fine. Yeah. Um, In your packet, there should be a, a, a topo map. I hope that it copied better than the one I saw. I, I actually found, I think, the one you're talking about. It follows immediately following yeah. the purple page. Yeah, and those are pretty accurate. The, uh, we've checked them out, and they're within a couple of feet. And uh, I hate to admit to a, an error, but it might be one. Um, like, Mr. Vig, what, what, what page are you looking at? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't have a page number stamped on it. Okay. Maybe we can find it by the purple page. What's the title on the purple page? The purple page is topographic okay. slash vicinity map photographs in Anchorage Daily News. Article. I also, okay. uh, it definitely slopes in that direction. There could be, I think, right at that spot. If I re I've been on that spot, and it does drop quite a bit right in the immediate vicinity of that power pole. Uh, that would be from the midpoint of the law. Huh? That would be from the midpoint. Yeah. 165 feet where the power pole is. I mean, the, the contour, the contours would tend to bear out what what I was no, estimating. I can't for find it. I've seen it. There it is. Okay. Um, these are four foot, so it's uh, two, four, six, eight, ten. 12, 14, 16. Well, these are four-foot contours. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is 20 feet. It's um, it's eight feet. Plus 20 feet, 28. Plus 16. 20 plus uh, 8, excuse me. So it'll be 30, uh, be around 32 feet. I don't have a calculator. Um, I can calculate this. Now, if you notice that the power pole where the road is, it drops fairly substantially on the eastern part of, or on the uh, western part of the property. There's a uh, Sort of a little rise right there, and there is. Uh, the general slope is uniform from the corner of his house over to there. Like I say, these are four foot contours, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of them. So it's 40 feet, which is about the height of the height of peak of the building. The height of the building is 32, about 34 feet. Okay. And that's quite a distance. I don't know what the slope is. I can, well, I can figure it like, out in a minute. It seems like the, the buildable area of that of the lot might be might be compromised by that slope, and I suspect that's probably why the road is located where it is, is at the top of the slope. Where, where, it, where it shows loop right there, the, the increased contours are from the septic system. I believe, because there's a mound right there that's built up. Mm -hmm. 
but otherwise than that, the contours are fairly reasonably uh, uniform. And I calculate that for, by going from the far north, uh, excuse me, the south east corner to the northwest corner. Okay. And then I had a question about, the, you, you spoke to it a little bit about what it is about this configuration that's unsuitable as a, as a single family dwelling, and it has somewhat to do with the exterior stairway, but are there other, well, are there two, other aspects that make that not workable? Usually the stairway is right in the, in the center of the building. It's kind of a center uh, feature of the building. There's two kitchens, uh, which take up room so there's area that's not necessary that uh, he probably didn't take into consideration when he when he did it. Uh, but they're just there, there's more that, there's more than just a building that makes a home. It makes it's it's the compactness of it, and I and I don't think it has that. I'm not saying it's really bad. I'm just saying it's not as good as. It wouldn't others. be what you design right out of the chute, but it, huh? it wouldn't be what you would design right with a no. clean sheet of paper, maybe. And that, and that's my own opinion on this. I, I looked at it and I said, you know, this is it's great for two people or two separate people, but not as a family. Okay, thank you. Any other questions by board members? Seeing none, does staff have any questions for the petitioner? No questions, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. All right, thank you, Mr. Keene. Uh, we'll open up the public hearing for public testimony. Okay. Um, the petitioners will have a chance for rebuttal after public testimony. All right. If there's anyone from the public wishing to testify, please come forward. Uh, please state your name and spell your last name for the record. My name is George Gaystouts. G E I S is in Sam, T is in Thomas, A U T is in Thomas, S is in Sam. Thank you, Mr. Gaystouts. You'll have uh, three minutes for uh, for your testimony. I have been a resident of Upper Glen Alps since 1975, which I believe makes me the third oldest household in terms of seniority up there. I uh, fully support granting the variance. Uh, I base that support not on analysis of seven points that your staff presented and so on, but on what I perceive as the impact on the area. I should say that until I saw the blue notice on the front door, I didn't realize this was a duplex. Uh, as I look at it, uh, I do not see what kind of significant negative impact having as the duplex would have on the area. Uh, the apartments, or the half of the duplexes are very small. They probably would not allow a very large family to live in either one. It's probably suitable for a couple or a single person in each one. Their septic system, I'm told, is uh, designed for four bedrooms. And apparently there are only two bedrooms in the place, so there should not be a septic impact. I'm sure all of you are aware about the question of traffic in Glen Alps going to the parking lot and our concern about the ability of uh, access, particularly emergency access for fire trucks and similar kinds of vehicles. Uh, this would not affect access at all. Uh, the number of cars that we would see going up most of Glen Alps Road would be increased by maybe four or five trips a day at the most, which is not totally insignificant. Uh, I believe there's adequate parking there. Uh, my house is on a lot above this house. Uh, I think it does offer an opportunity for a young couple or an individual to try Glen Alps to see if they want to live up there. I listened to all the talk about the zoning and so on, and the reality is this was zoned probably by a bulldozer many, many decades ago without the person really being cognizant of all of these various regulations. And I was one of the people who voted for unification at the unification time, and I was rather shocked to see that there was an attempt to put down a number of code kinds of things up there. I believe it's reasonable to have a code for a septic system, for well water, but in other ways, 
we were told that we'd be able to keep our approach to building up there, and it appears that to some extent that's not so. So I very much uh, support the variance. I don't think it will have a significant impact on the neighborhood. I don't think it will significantly lead to a rash of uh, duplexes being built up there. And uh, that's basically my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Case. Uh, do any board members have questions? Seeing none. Any questions by staff? Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony, sir. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to testify? If so, please come forward. Good evening. Please uh, state your name and spell your last name for the record. My name is Carl Lexinger. Last name is spelled L U C H. S-I-N-G-E-R. Thank you, Mr. Luxinger. You uh, will have three minutes for your, test or for your testimony. I support the staff recommendations that this not be variance being granted. Um, I live at uh, 13,441 Glenelps Road, which is two lots above the duplex. We can stand in our living room, look at this building every day. Uh, I was lived on Hillside for a long time and fought for a lot of the zoning that we currently have, the R6, and why we don't have any commercial zoning east of Lake Otis in the 70s. And this man got a duplex, or the petitioner got a uh, permit to build a single family house. He has built six or seven other houses in the area. He knew, he knew that he could not build a duplex in the area, but he he circumvented the rules by getting a duplex, so he had a permit and built a duplex instead of the building a single family home. But we have, uh, our well has a capacity of 0.19 gallons per minute for the house that we have. So we have a large storage tank to keep the water in, so it's a really low flow area in the wells, 150 feet into the bedrock. And the other thing about having a duplex in the area of rentals is that he has another uh, unit that's a house and recently working on the roads, the people that live in these houses are normally younger and they drive a lot faster than the older people that live there. And it's a 25 mile an hour zone and they go zipping by you and it seems like there's and we don't have any police to enforce those kind of rules and the roads are dirt and so it's dusty. And those are problems to have if you have rentals and you have younger population that live and have those kind of vehicles. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Luxinger. Uh, do any board members have questions? Okay. Staff? Okay. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to testify on this case? Good evening. Uh, please state your name, spell your last name for the record. My name is Tim Cavanaugh. That's spelled K-A-V-A-N-A-G-H. I've prepared a written statement. Thank you for the floor. Hello, neighbors. I, um, I live on an abutting property. That would be the 13321 Alpweg address. And I'd like to first acknowledge respect for those who precede us in developing a community we can all live with. I, uh, having studied the applicant disposition, uh, documents surrounding the property 13324, and the Municipal Planning Department staff analysis of this variance, a conclusion has been drawn. I agree with the staff findings and recommendation the variance standards have not been satisfied. Respective of the seven variance standards and findings thereof, uh, number one, there are no usual physical, unusual physical features which directly relate to the need for this variance. Number two, uh, the owner's not being deprived of rights commonly enjoyed, enjoyed by other properties in the area. I, I, I see that um, the standard has not been met. Number three, um, the permit application papers were for a 
single family dwelling unit, which is basis for the R9 and the curtailment of extension of any of those rights. So um, as far as uh, this business decision, decision, which was clearly stated on the permit, the, uh, the zoning classification alone does not constitute a valid ground for the variance. This was a foregone conclusion. Number four, it's proposed that a neighborhood complaint that led to the observation of this violation was one of concern that, and I quote, the character of the neighborhood could be changed. I agree, this standard has not been met. Um, the number five of the seven variance standards, the neighborhood has developed a single family dwelling in a low density R9 zoning district. I believe that the character of the neighborhood will change if this application is approved. Despite the infeasibility of public sewer and water. On number six, I look at the, uh, the lot is substantially under standard lot size for a duplex. It's that simple. Number seven, the lot is substantially under standard lot size for a duplex. It's sufficient for a single family dwelling. This is my understanding of the code. So I'd like to thank the Zoning Board of Examiners and the community for the opportunity to participate and take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Kavanaugh. Uh, do any board members have questions? Okay. Mr. Barrett? Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony, right. sir. Thank you. Hello, please state your name and spell your last name for the record. My name's Mark Rodman, R-O-D-M-A-N. Uh, I'd have to go with, I think, should be denied the duplex. Um, the, the standards have been in force for quite a few years before 96. Um, pretty much most everybody up there knows what the standards and regulations are. Um, in fact, I don't even know how he got a permit to put a single family dwelling <clears throat> with uh, septic under a muni maintained road. Uh, I know that they won't let other people do that, and yet somehow he was able to do that. I just assumed he happened to know somebody at the city that allowed him to be able to do things like this. That's why I never even questioned the duplex. So basically that's it. That's, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Rodman. Uh, does the board have any questions? No? Mr. Barrett? Uh, just a couple of quick comments, sure. Mr. Chairman. Um, the road isn't truly a muni road. It's considered a driveway or a travel way. Um, as such, um, the septic system, the, the tank or the drain field would not allow to have that travelway pass over it. But pipes connecting it to the home, it's not against code. So the septic system is legal. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rodman, for your testimony. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to uh, come forward and testify? My name is Cecilia Hidalgo, H-I-D-A-L-G-O. I just, I'll make it very brief, I just want to comment on a couple of the things that I heard said. Um, for instance, no knowledge of the regulations. He is a builder. He built several houses there. It was his obligation to know what all the requirements were. He knew there was to be a variance if he was going to put a duplex. As far as the house not being conducive to a single family, he chose that building. He moved it on there. That was his decision. He knew when he saw it if it was going to work or not as a single family dwelling. Therefore, I don't think those are viable reasons. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, if you'll hold on just a minute here okay. for questions. Any questions for Ms. Hidalgo? No? Mr. Barrett? 
Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony, ma'am. Anyone else from the public? All right. Good evening. Hi. Um, my name is Teresa Cavanaugh, K-A-V-A-N-A-G-H. Uh, I live in the Glen Alps community at 13321 Alpweg. I have lived in a single-family home adjacent to the subject lot since the fall of 1993, approximately 18 years. I'm here tonight as a citizen concerned with the future of the Glen Alps neighborhood. I would like to respectfully request that the board follow the recommendation of the planning department and deny the request for variance. After reading the zoning application, I did not perceive the seven standards required to grant a variance have been proved. As to standard one, the physical conditions of the land are not inconsistent with the neighboring lots. Many of the lots have similar challenges, including slope, seasonal drainage, roads that bisect the lots, and utility easements that follow the roads. There is nothing particularly unique to the subject property to warrant a duplex over a single family home. As to standard two, the applicant's rights are not being denied. There are no other duplexes on any 1.25 acre lots in the area. The duplex housing arrangement is not commonly enjoyed by other properties. As to standard three, I perceive the actions of the applicant were voluntary and self-created. The zone approval stamp on the original as-built specifically states, approved plans and specifications shall not be changed, modified, or altered without first obtaining a valid change order. However, this was not acted on. As to standard four, I strongly believe the approved variance would adversely affect the use of the adjacent property. An approval of variance in this case could set a precedent for the neighborhood. All of the vacant 1.25 acre lots in this area could now be approved for duplexes. Current single family homeowners could also apply for a variance, then remodel their homes into duplexes. I do not believe that this was the original low density intent of zoning this area R9, especially since it may be a long time, if ever, that city water and sewer might reach this area. If the variance is approved, yet not precedent setting, then this one loan property will have special privileges above those of its neighbors. As to standard five, the character of most of the neighborhood is single family homes with long term residence and infrequent change of ownership. In contrast, in my observation, the duplex has had more occupant turnover than any other structure in the area. This is not congruent with the character of the neighborhood. As to standard six, restrictions on lot size for structures are in the best interest of the public welfare. The lot is one third the size required, not a negligible amount. As to standard seven, I believe a reasonable use of the land is a remodeled single family home. This would be congruent to the minimum standard every 1.25 acre lot in the area has historically been subject to. Approving a variance for the first area wide duplex does not seem like a last resort. This could have a great impact on the future of the neighborhood. I'd like to respectfully request that the board follow the recommendation of the planning department and deny the request for variance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kavanaugh. Uh, do any board members have questions? Mr. Barrett? Thank you very much for your testimony this evening. Anyone else from the public like to testify on this case? Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Mike C. Wright. Last name spelled S E W R I G H T. And I previously submitted a written comment online. And I noticed that your packet has been updated with my previous comments. Uh, I own a lot in Glen Alps. Uh, it's a uh, Township 12 North, Range 2 West, Section 30, W2NE4N, uh, W4NE4SE4. Basically, uh, I think it's about an acre and a quarter like the other lots up there. And uh, I've owned that lot since 1980, about 1980. I've been a resident of the Anchorage area since 1953. Uh, I lived up in Glen Alps one summer back in around 1975 in a small rented uh, dwelling and fell in love with the area and now that I'm re I've recently retired like a month ago uh, I plan to finally build my residence up there my, my dream residence 
Uh, and I, I support this variance, variance request. Um, as one who lived up there in a small dwelling and recognized the experience it can give to other young folks, and I was much younger then, of course, in 1975, uh, I think I don't have a problem with, with this duplex as it's referred to, the way it's constructed. The footprint is smaller uh, than most of the residents up, residences up there. The bedrooms are fewer. The number of people are fewer. Uh, the impact on the septic system is less, as others have uh, commented on. Uh, I think it allows a, a low impact natural setting experience that young couples or young singles couldn't otherwise afford up there, like I was. And uh, I'm all for the variance. I think it fits the neighborhood and the reasonable intent of the code. It makes a few folks' lives richer, and I, I think we need to be sensible about this. Um, I don't think it results in additional disturbances or, or anything like that. I live in a single-family residence neighborhood in Old Turnigan. There are times those residences are rented out, um, and maybe somebody has more parties during that period than you're used to. And then there are other residences where people have lived there for 30 years, and they have parties. And they have a lot of parked cars when they're having a party. Uh, this, there's no significant, no real impact here, and I think no real risk of uh, this becoming a duplex-laden community. People are going to retain their existing residences, and I, the character of the neighborhood will not change in any significant regard if you allow this one variance. Now, just quickly, um, I noticed that there are seven standards, and they're referred to as standards that you consider as the board. In my experience, standards are items that you weigh. It's in your discretion as the board to weigh these items. Uh, they're, they're not uh, ironclad conditions. And I think if you take a sensible approach here, you'll grant the variance weighing those standards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seawright. Um, do any board members have questions for Mr. Seawright? No? Uh, Mr. Barrett? OK. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to testify? Okay. Seeing none, Mr. Barrett, do you have any rebuttal? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a closing comment. There have been several references to the intent in the R9 district. Without getting into the detail of all of those um, issues, R9 is a very low density district, one unit on two and a half acres. And what we have here is two units on an acre and a quarter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Um, the petitioner uh, does have three minutes for rebuttal. On conclusion, the public testimony and staff all by the applicant shall have a right rebuttal three minutes each. Mr. Barrett, am I in error here? I'm sorry? Am I in error here, or does the petitioner have an opportunity for rebuttal? I, I thought the timer had run out. Okay. But I, the department would have no objection to 60 seconds. There were many uh, speakers in opposition. Would, would any board members have objection to an additional minute by the petitioner? Okay. Mr. Keene, if you could please keep it to a minute. Um, sure. Sorry for the confusion, Mr. Keene. If, if you had a rebuttal, uh, we'd be willing to allow you an additional minute. It's not a rebuttal. It's, it's a, an answer. Oh, even better. Uh, the elevation is, is close to the contours, maybe about four feet. Uh, from one end to the other is 12.5% corner to corner. The building footprint is going to be raised artificially to have a level spot from the top of that foundation 
So that corner is 17.4%. The east-west lines are both 9.3%. The north-south line on the east is 9%. And the line on the uh, west is 185 so right at that end, it is steeper. Thank and you, uh, I don't think we have more to say. Thank you very much. All right, with that, the uh, public testimony portion of the hearing is closed. Uh, in fact, the hearing is closed as, as well. Uh, and the matter now rests with the board. Um, if I could have a positive motion from a board member, please. Mr. Cars, um, indicated that you've made a motion. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in case number 2011-050, a I move that we grant a variance from 2140-050F lot dimensions to allow an existing duplex on a lot of 1.247 acres, approximately 54,000. 313 square feet when the minimum required lot size for a duplex is 3.75 acres or 163,350 square feet, a shortage of 2.5 acres or 66 percent, subject to the conditions 1 through 5 on page 12 of the staff packet. Thank you, Mr. Cars. Uh, is there a second? Ms. Williams. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Cars, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I uh, I do not intend to support this motion, um, finding in essence that uh, my my decision with respect to the seven standards falls in line with those outlined by uh, the staff as well as uh, some of the residents here. I do want to say I appreciate. Um, all the public testimony that, that uh, people have made this evening, um, both in support and uh, uh, in opposition to the, the variance request. Um, with respect to the, well, a general comment, and I think Mr. Barrett kind of hit it on the head for me at, at his last comment, um, this is a uh, variance request for a duplex um, when um, it, the requirement would be for 3.75 acres for a duplex with a lot that is um, only 1.25 acres. So uh, I think it's an overbuilt um, lot with a duplex. Uh, with respect to the st standards, uh, standard one, uh, concur with staff, there are no unusual physical features which directly relate to the need for the variance. Um, Standard number two, I concur with staff that that standard uh, is not substantially met, uh, again, because uh, of the small lot size, Title 21 would limit construction to a single family home, similar to others that exist in the neighborhood. Uh, do not find that standard three is met, find that this is a, um, a self-imposed hardship. The permit application papers indicated the applicant was building a new single-family home. Standard four, um, the, um, I think there has been discussion that um, the property would have superior rights. This is duplex to other properties in the neighborhood, so I, I do not find that the, that standard is met. Um, standard five, and uh, while I see staff has said this, partially met. Um, I, I also concur with their comments that the characteristics of the neighborhood would be, would be damaged if this variance was granted. Uh, standard six, um, again, th with the standard, while well, staff says partially met, I think that's it's a stretch to say partially met um, because of the lot size requirements f that, that are required for a duplex. And I, I do not find that standard seven is met as well because the, the lot is short, the 100, 109,000 square feet required for a duplex. Uh, so for that reasons, I, those reasons, I do not intend to support the motion. Thank you, Mr. Cars. Ms. Williams, would, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you. Um, 
I agree with um, staff and with uh, Mr. Cars, and I also do not intend to support the variance request. Um, walking through the standards quickly, I also agree that um, standard one is not substantially met um, because the lot is um, simply too small and it does um, have the same physical characteristics as other properties in the area um, as the uh, petitioner um, even stated in, in uh, his uh, petition. Um, two, I also do not believe um, that that standard is substantially met um, because, again, the physical characteristics of the property in question are similar um, to the other properties in the area. Three, standard three, I also do not believe that's substantially met either. Um, because I do believe the hardship was self-imposed um, in that the petitioner did um, request a, and uh, receive a building permit for a single family home and um, then did not uh, request permission to uh, alter that permit um, when deciding to build a duplex. Um, standard four, um, I uh, don't agree with staff on this one. I, I don't believe that this is um, partially met, I believe it's not substantially met, um, as illustrated by the um, testimony of others, neighbors in the area that um, oppose the variance request and have concerns about um, uh, how a duplex in the area could change the characteristics of the neighborhood. Um, five, uh, I believe, I agree with staff that that is partially met because this is a, a dimensional, not a use variance. Um, Six, I also agree with um, with staff that it that it's uh, the standard um, is at least partially met um, for for the reasons um, described, um, and then standard seven, I do not believe that's substantially met um, because uh, reasonable use of the land would be a single family home. So for those reasons, I intend uh, not to support the variance request. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, any other board members like to weigh in? Okay. Um, for the record, I do not intend to support the motion either for the reasons uh, stated by Mr. Cars and Ms. Williams. Uh, I'm in agreement with uh, their findings of the seven standards. I uh, do believe that the uh, lot is overbuilt uh, with the duplex and the overwhelming public testimony um, speaking to standards five, six, and seven as well about the character of the zoning district um, in relation to the use of the property. Um, seeing no other comments, if we could please vote. That motion is denied, uh, seven votes in opposition. Uh, I must read for the record, every final decision of the board shall clearly state on its face that it is a final decision with respect to all issues involved in the case and that the parties have 30 days from the date of mailing or other distribution of the decision to file an appeal to the superior court. Uh, thank you all for your testimony this evening. Uh, I appreciate your time. Okay. Um, that concludes our first case for the evening. Case number two, uh, H2, 2011-063, uh, is the applicant, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Uh, David or Carol Jensen, present? Uh, they've indicated they're here. Thank you. Um, could staff please provide sufficiency of notice? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. 53 public hearing notices were mailed. Two were returned in favor. One was initially returned opposed. However, the author of the comment in opposition did um, send to the department today a revised comment that stated support for the variance, and that revised comment was laid on the table tonight. Thank you, Ms. O'Brien. Please uh, proceed with your presentation. Um, this is a variance request from AMC 2140080. 
to allow a principal structure to encroach four and a half feet into the requ into our required 25 foot side yard setback in the R6 district. The property is a corner lot with frontage onto O'Malley Road and Berenick Street. Driveway access to the property is from Berenick Street. The lot is developed with a single family structure. It was built in 1993. There is also a detached garage and a shed. Um, the principal dwelling encroaches four and a half feet into the side yard. And the shed, which is shown on the as built on page two of, two of the packet, is shown within the front yard setback. Uh, that shed has been relocated to an, a conforming location on the lot. It is not the subject of variance. It's also not permitted to be in the front yard. Um, so it has, has been re relocated. And speaking with Mr. Jensen this evening, um, he will be sending um, a photograph to the department showing the uh, shed in its new location. Um, in reviewing the uh, standards for um, granting a variance, it appears that standard one is uh, substantially met. This is a triangular shaped lot. There is a stream bisecting the property that requires a 50 foot stream maintenance easement. Um, also, the location of the septic system on the property is limited by the required 100 foot separation distance from the stream. Um, the lot contains only 42,206 square feet, and it only conforms to the R6 district land uh, area, lot area requirements by virtue of including one half the area of each abutting right of way. So there are some um, difficulties in developing this property. Um, standard two appears to be substantially met because denial of the variance would re involve removing a significant portion of the existing structure, which is the kitchen area of the dwelling unit, of the, yeah, the dwelling unit. Um, standard three does appear to be met based on the physical characteristics of the lot. And standard four appears to be substantially met as there are no separation violations on the property. Project, no, private development um, has noted in their comments that there are no known drainage problems and um, other issues that would potentially impact adjoining properties. It does not appear that um, Granting the variance would adversely affect the adjacent property given the length of time the dwelling has existed without notice or complaint by the, um, anybody in the surrounding area. Uh, standard five appears to be substantially met as the variance is dimensional and not a use variance. It appears that development of the lot is consistent with the development that has occurred in the surrounding area Standard six appears to be substantial met as there are no identified health or safety issues, especially based on the comments from the um, private development. And fire and emergency response vehicles are able to access the property for life safety. And it is the um, standard seven, it appears to be the minimum variance that would allow a um, continued use of the dwelling in its current location and without having to remove a substantial portion of the structure. Um, the department does recommend approval subject to two conditions that are noted on page seven of the packet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. O'Brien. Uh, do any board members have questions for staff? I don't know if uh, my screen's working properly, so if anybody does have a question, please indicate so with a hand signal or throw something at me. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. O'Brien. Uh, okay. Oh, Mr. Vig shows up. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, would the petition petitioner please come forward? Please uh, state and spell your last name for the record. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is David Jensen, J-E-N-S-E-N. -E uh, accompanying me is my wife, Carol Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Um, you'll have 10 minutes for your presentation. If you would both like to speak, please keep that in mind. Uh, and also ask that you speak to the seven standards. Thank you very much. I think I know how contestants on America's Got Talent feel right now <laughs> without the promise of a Vegas trip. Let's see it. <laughs> I think that uh, most of the points have probably been covered. I'm going to keep my comments very brief. Um, I'm looking forward to being out in the sunshine and enjoying my property in the sunshine this evening. Um, however, uh, just small points uh, to uh, uh, reiterate, I suppose. Uh, we purchased our home uh, three, four years ago, uh, time escapes me, uh, without knowledge that our house was an encroachment. We're the fourth owners of this home since it was built in 1993. There was no disclosure of this problem, uh, regardless of as built that had been presented over the years for each of those previous sales. Um, we were uh, uh, unaware that there was an encroachment issue. Had we known that, uh, uh, I don't know how that would have affected our decision to purchase the home, but I certainly know that uh, at whatever point in our life we decide to sell our home without a variance, I think that we'll be hard pressed to sell our home knowing that it would be impossible to acquire a permit from the city for any improvements, be it a roof, be it a remodel inside the home, um, or anything exceeding $5,000 which meets the requirements for having permitting. So um, we're trying to uh, satisfy a legality that uh, through the variance process that has never been done in the past. Uh, we've requested uh, uh, permitting information, original permit information and inspection information from when the house was actually built to see how this could have actually happened or if there was some permit uh, or uh, how, again, with the unusual uh, design of our lot, a pie-shaped pie lot, how, how a contractor could go forward and, and build a house that's encroaching into a setback, and uh, the uh, municipality is unable to provide that, and I'm certainly unable to provide any kind of information that justifies how this could have happened. Um, removing our house is not an option, uh, or moving the house, rather, is not an option. Uh, it, it, it's just it's, it's not even conceivable. Removing the kitchen from its current location would be a structural issue for the house. Uh, uh, there literally is no other place to put the kitchen, not to mention the fact that it's a uh, load-bearing wall on two sides for, uh, uh, for this home. Um, as noted, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Lots of support. I don't believe we have any objections, at least none that we're aware of, uh, regarding the current nature of our home. We've approached all of our neighbors in person. Uh, they have all approved. We've toured the home with some of our neighbors. I've approached the Huffman O'Malley uh, Community Council. They have no objections to our variance. From uh, what I see, uh, staff has no objections to uh, our variance request. and. Um, I think that just for the good of the neighborhood, uh, this is something that should be uh, uh, a fairly straightforward process. And unfortunately, for the last year or so, it hasn't been as straightforward as I would have wished. But um, I am asking for approval uh, from the commission. Uh, uh, and I'm open to any questions whatsoever. Thank you, Mr. And Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do any board members have questions for Mr. Jensen? Mr. Vig. Thank you. Um, Mr. Jensen, although it, it isn't a part of the case that is before us tonight, it, it seems to me that I've seen this, your, your property come before us before and was withdrawn. As I recall, you, you were planning to do an expansion of some sort that, or an alteration to your structure, and, and those plans have changed, and, and really you're just looking for uh, a variance to cover what's in place today. Is that is that right? Mr. Chair, Mr. Vig, 
That is correct. We had submitted previously a variance request that was uh, multi-dimensional. Uh, our architect had presented, and that is actually who discovered originally that we had an encroachment uh, into the setback issue, had proposed, in addition to the house, which would have expanded a very small kitchen that we already have, into the setback as well. We've uh, retreated from that position, and we've decided to engage our architect to find other remedies to expand our kitchen. So we have no plans whatsoever in uh, uh, the near future that we're aware of to make any other further variance requests. We're just looking for the existing structure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions by the board? No. Does staff have any questions for the petitioner? No, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Thank you very much. Is there anyone from the public wishing to testify in this case? Okay. Seeing no one willing to testify, uh, that portion of the hearing is closed. Uh, I would assume there's no rebuttal, but I need to ask the question. Is there any rebuttal? Okay. Seeing none. Um, with that, the public hearing is closed, uh, and the matter now rests with the board. I please have a positive motion from a board member. Mr. Vig. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in case number 2011-063, I move that we grant a variance from AMC 21400080G2 to allow an existing structure to encroach 4.5 feet into the 25-foot side yard setback subject to department recommendations one and two on page seven of the staff packet. Thank you, Mr. Vig. Uh, Ms. Denny, um, have you seconded? Yes, I have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vig, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I agree with staff's analysis of this, of this case. Um, I, I, with regard to standard number one, I believe that uh, the presence of the creek that uh, uh, runs across this this lot is a an extraordinary physical circumstance that uh, creates uh, some constraints on building sites. Uh, so I believe that that is standard is substantially met. Standard number two: uh, strict application of these uh, of this code would cre would create an exceptional or undue hardship. I believe because of the physical circumstances that are present. Uh, denial would require moving a significant portion of the kitchen. As the uh, petitioner stated, uh, it's been there since 1993. Standard number three, uh, the hardship is not self-imposed. Um, again, I, uh, I, the staff's analysis indicates that this is, they believe it to be partially met, I believe substantially it's substantially met in that uh, in a, on a, at least four occasions, uh, apparently when as-builts were taken, that uh, either the, the encroachment was, was not identified or not, uh, not correctly located so that uh, a person uh, buying a property would, would tend to rely on those uh, as-builts without and without disclosures would have very little way of discovering them. So I, I believe that that third standard is substantially met. Uh, n number four, the variance of granted will not adversely affect the use of adjacent property. I believe that's substantially met. The comments of uh, neighbors indicate that to be the case. They don't believe uh, there's any impact to their property that I can see. Standard number five, uh, the variance of granted will not change the character of the zoning district. I believe that that's substantially met. Uh, uh, the variance of granted in number six would not affect adversely the health, safety, and welfare of the people of the municipality. I believe that to be substantially met. Uh, there's been no identified health or safety issues, fire, and uh, emergency response have access. It's simply an encroachment into a side yard and uh, setback. And uh, standard number seven, 
variance is the minimum that will make possible a reasonable use of the land. I believe that uh, uh, the kitchen is a, an essential part of a home, and the applicant stated that their original plans were to were to expand, and, and the encroachment was actually would have been larger. They've uh, uh, withdrawn those plans and are simply looking to get a variance for what's in place, and so I believe that to be the minimum variance that's uh, necessary to make a reasonable use of the land. So I intend to support the motion. Thank you, Mr. Vig. Uh, Ms. Denny, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, I agree with Mr. Vig and with staff and that the seven standards have been substantially met. Uh, the shape of the lot, the location of the creek, and the, the house size being in parity with the neighbors uh, pretty much limited where the house could be be set. And it's unfortunate that that the offset wasn't discovered prior to the present owners. Um, on standard number two, I also agree that it's substantially met. It's uh, having to remove a portion of your house that's already existing would be an undue hardship. Um, standard number three, the hardship's not self-imposed. Um, it's something that was not discovered prior to the purchase of the home. It looks a couple of purchases back by the looks of it. Um, standard number four will not, the, the, the variance if granted, will not adversely affect the use of adjacent property. Uh, um, I did see that there was one dissenting comment in your packet that one of your neighbors didn't agree with your variance. Um, however, I don't think that, uh, that that should be an issue. Um, the, number five, the variance of granted is in keeping with the intent of this code. Uh, the standard is pretty much substantially met, um, having gone, going back again to the shape of the lot, having to plot the septic in the well in, in the position that they're in because of the creek. I believe it's substantially met. Variance number six uh, would uh, not adversely affect the health and safety and welfare of the people in the municipality. I believe that's also substantially met. And the variance of granted on number seven, the minimum variance that will make the possible a reasonable use of the land, I believe that having 4.5 feet is a, a very minimum. So I intend to support the motion. Thank you, Ms. Denny. Uh, with that, uh, the motion is up for board discussion. Anyone else wishing to comment? Okay. Um, please, oh, Mr. Cars. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just real quickly uh, for uh, response to Ms. Denny's comment. I, I also intend to support the motion, but I, I do believe that the the one comment that was received in our staff packet has been superseded by what was handed out to us this this evening with that property owner. Um, stating he had originally objected to it, but after speaking with the Jensen's, he now supports the, the variance request. So uh, just for the record, wanted to, to state that, um, but I do intend to support the motion concurring with the findings of staff, Ms. Mr. Vig and, and Ms. Denny. Thank you, Mr. Kars. Um, any other board member comments? Seeing none, please vote. That motion passes with seven votes in favor. Uh, must read for the record. Every final decision of the board shall clearly state on its face it is a final decision with respect to all issues involved in the case and that the parties have 30 days from the date of mailing or other distribution of the decision to file an appeal to the Superior Court. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ms. Jensen, for your time. Thank you. Have a good evening. Would any board members be opposed to a five minute recess? Okay, all right, let's take five minutes. Let's uh, proceed uh, with the public hearing on to uh, case H3, 2011-065. Uh, Is the petitioner Mary Alice Johnson and or uh, Matthew Johnson present? Okay. Um, they've indicated that they're here. Um, Mr. Barrett, please provide uh, sufficiency of notice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The property was posted and advertised. Uh, we mailed 118 public hearing notices for this uh, application. Did not receive any response, responses in support or in opposition. Uh, there was one phone call from a neighbor across the alley 
who uh, didn't register an opinion but said he was no longer concerned once he understood what the variance was. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Please, uh, please proceed with your case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a variance uh, for yard setback reduction. A 20-foot front yard setback is required along F Street, and a 5-foot side yard setback is required between lots 5 and 6. Uh, and since this is a legal non-conforming structure, the changes, the new construction being proposed for the building requires that we add that part of the uh, in as part of the variance as well, um, expansion of a non-conforming structure. The as-built is on page three, and I'd like to spend just a second with that uh, because it's not immediately obvious what's going on. You will see on page three that the two lots are five and six, and that the house is on the southern portion and crosses the line between five and six. Immediately to the north of the house and running at a slight diag diagonal is a fence line that you can see. That's also a property line. This is actually four small squares of property. It's not just two lots, five and six. It's the north portions of five and six and the south portions of five and six. So uh, when you see the structure on the south portions of five and six, you can see the front yard setback. It's 12 feet from the front property line, but it also crosses the property line. Normally, a variance cannot be used to cross a property line, and we're going to stay consistent with that because there is another very straightforward remedy for the owner, and it's also a good long-term remedy for the property, and that uh, is to erase that interior lot line, and we'll get to that as part of one of the conditions. The South Addition was platted in 1940. That's when lots five and six were created. In 1946, the south portions and the north portions of lots five and six were created by warranty deed. Then a little bit later on in 1946, the house was built. We were able to find a building permit for that. Zoning did not come into effect until 1952, and modern zoning, current zoning, R2M, did not come into effect until 1985. There have been occasional permits on the property throughout the years, but what you see on the as-built is essentially what existed in 1946. Been no change to the footprint. The house was built after planning, after platting, but before zoning was adopted. The house is a legal non-conforming structure, and the lots are legal non-conforming lots of record. The two small pieces of property, when added together, the south portions of five and six, combined to a total size of 6,250 square feet, which exceeds the R2M minimum lot size of 6,000 square feet. The house encroaches the 20-foot front yard setback on F Street by about 8 feet. It has a 12-foot setback. And the house crosses the property line uh, of 5 and 6. Technically, that could qualify for a variance, but we believe we have another better, longer-term solution for that. Because the house is a non-conforming structure, Major repairs to it require a variance from the non-conforming section of the code 2155. There's also a shed with an attached fence along the south lot line and abutting the alley. Um, that will need to, the shed and fence will need to be moved to a conforming location. The variance is necessary, why it's here, because the owner wishes to replace what appears to be a very old roof uh, with a new insulated roof. He will maintain the existing he will maintain the existing encroachments and will not otherwise increase the footprint of the building. The new roof does cause the house to lose its non-conforming rights, but the variance and a replat will make the house legal forever. Well, I shouldn't say forever, that's a long time. Regarding the standards, number one, there exist exceptional physical circumstances that are not applicable to other land in the same district, the standard's partially met. There is some slope at the southeast corner, but for the most part of it, um, it's within the five-foot yard setback, so we could not find that it is directly applicable to the need for the variance, and that's why the standard is only partially met. But the lots were created. Um, uh, before zoning was in place, so that explains uh, somewhat how, how the error occurred. 
when the house was built, uh, the, the builder at that time should have been aware that he was building across a lot line, but that north-south lot line that divides uh, five and six is not a platted lot line. It's just by warranty deed, so it is not uncommon for those types of, of uh, lot lines to be missed in, in the review or in the permit process. Standard two, because of the physical circumstances, strict application would deprive the applicant of common enjoyment rights. This standard is also partially met. Strict application would require that a new house be built with conforming setbacks. There are some physical and historical circumstances which do affect the property, but they're not all directly related to the need for the variance, which is why we find the standard only partially met. Standard number three is the most difficult for this case, that it is not self-imposed, and we find the standard, or we believe the standard is not substantially met. For the first part of the, of the standard, there are no unique natural physical conditions directly related to the need for the variance. And although the house was built after platting but before zoning, it is an owner's obligation to check the property's history and see what he or she may be getting into. And this, this raises a question that I'll try and anticipate why in the previous case when the owners bought into a pre-existing case, uh, pre-existing condition with standard three met for them and in this case where the owners bought into a pre-existing condition the standard is not met for them. It's an excusable error in, in our opinion. In the previous case the house is well situated on the lot and it's not visually or overtly obvious that that house is encroaching a yard setback. In this case, it's not quite so obvious. The house is well situated on the lot, but there's small lots and the house and the house right next to it, which is in a similar predicament, appear to be taking up a lot of space and possibly encroaching the setbacks possibly even coming to the point of getting close to lot coverage, which they do not do. Uh, the, the short answer for standard number three is just looking at this property, it would appear that further investigation was necessary before jumping into it. For standard number four, the variance does not adversely affect the neighbors. That is substantially met. Uh, for all the small size of the lot and the orientation of the house on the property, the encroachment does not appear to be detrimental, no structural separation issues, no drainage issues, and the encroachments have been in place for about 60 years. Standard number five, the variance if granted is in keeping with the intent of the code. This is substantially met. This is a dimensional variance. Standard six, the variance if granted does not adversely affect the wider area around the neighborhood. That is also substantially met as in standard four. No negative issues identified, no fire separation issues. Project management and engineering reports no drainage issues. And standard number seven, the variance is the minimum variance to make possible a reasonable use of the land. This is substantially met. The house footprint is not being changed. This is a 60-year-old problem, and a new properly insulated roof is not an extreme request. Because standard three does not appear to be substantially met, the department recommends denial. But should the board find for approval, we do have four conditions on pages nine and 10. And I have a note to myself to remind Mr. Olson that the roof does require a permit. And when he comes in for a roof permit, he should be prepared to address the comments from the structural engineer, which are on page 23 of the department report. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Uh, do any board members have questions of, for staff? Mr. Vig. Mr. Barrett, I wondered if I could ask you to clarify a little bit in standard number three. In part A, it says the encroachments occurred after platting and zoning regulations were in place. Is it after after platting, but prior to zoning? A good call, thank you, Mr. Vig. My my boo boo. After platting, but before zoning. And similarly, in paragraph B, 
The house was built after platting, but prior to zoning regulations being in place. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Mr. Barrett, I, sticking with uh, Standard 3, and this is a, a, just, a, I guess, a personal issue that I've always dealt with on these um, homes that come before us for ver or these variances that come before us for buildings that have non-conforming rights and uh, um, the statement that um, that cited 2155-010 intent uh, and in bold is the intent of this chapter to permit these non-conformities to continue until they were removed but not to encourage their perpetuation. It is further the intent of this chapter that nonconformities shall not be enlarged upon, expanded, or extended. In this case, this is, it's not being an enlarged upon or expanded. It's just being extended, in my opinion. I'm going to go back to a, call, a question that uh, I believe Mr. Marsh used to ask. Why do we care? <laughs> is it a no harm, no foul? Mr. Chair, Mr. Carr is one of Mr. Marsh's favorites. Why do we care? Um, it is the non-conforming section of the code. A new roof is considered to be extending the property, maybe not physically, but extends it through time. A new roof is going to give at least another 40 to 50 years to the structure. And part of the intent also is that non-conformities not be encouraged to be perpetuated. And that's directly related to the roof. The roof's going to allow the home to continue. It is a legal size lot. There is um, legal area for the home to be built. So we do see it in conflict with 2155 and have to point it out. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Good job of uh, not answering my question, but answering my question. Uh, Mr. Barrett, I do have a question. Uh, are you aware of? Um, any other um, uh, variances in this area or um, houses within the same setback along F Street? Um, Mr. Chairman, nothing, jumped, nothing that jumped out at me. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Barrett? Okay. Seeing none, uh, petitioner would please come forward. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. Matthew Olson, O-L-S-O-N. Uh, and just to clarify, my wife's last name is Johnson, so. Thank you, Mr. Olson. You'll have 10 minutes for your presentation. And again, as you've heard earlier this evening, we ask that you speak to the seven standards. Okay, um, thank you for the, for the floor. Um, uh, to begin with, uh, standard number one, um, the extraordinary physical circumstances. Um, I believe that the um, the view of the mountains was was uh, in the minds of the builders when building um, both properties that are on lots five and six. Um, since then, um, lot four was uh, further developed, and uh, the house north of mine. Um, which is addressed on on um, 14th Street, but it's also a log house built by the same builder. Has lost its view because of uh, uh, the building on Lot Four having gone in. Um, I our our house retains that view. Um, so by positioning the house at the angle it, that it was positioned, it it points straight uh, at the mountains. Um, I think that's why it was done, how it was done. Um, but beyond that, um, uh, there is a, a substantial slope on the southeast um, portion of the lot. Um, I have included in the packet a picture of that. Um, I'm not sure what page it's on. It, it's a fairly short package. But if you go back, um, there's a, a picture of the property. As I say, it's a, a log home. Um, there are uh, approximately five photos. And if you look on the bottom left, um, it shows uh, the slope. 
Um, and since then, I have actually uh, actually recently completed my own topographical drawing of the property, um, which I brought with me tonight. I did not submit it into the packet. Um, if it pleases the board, I could present that copy to you to be passed around. I, I know that that would be uh, irregular, but uh, that is. That would be acceptable, Mr. Olson. We'd just have to keep it for 30 days and enter it into the record. If you're willing to do that, we'd be more than happy to take a look. Okay, and I apologize. It's it's still uh, a work in progress, um, and I'm I'm not a or a um, I'm not uh, uh, skilled in in uh, these kind of things. Um, but let me just pass it. If you could, Mr. Olson, come uh, here. Um, the from the southeast corner of the lot to the house is uh, approximately 14 feet of elevation. Um, I have those listed in inches, and the contours are every 15 inches. I've since uh, revised that a little bit to every 12 inches would would be a foot. The the it ends up being anywhere from at the bottom about a, two, a 20 percent grade up uh, to 30 or more. I think um, now if you were to suggest moving the house, for example, um, it would be very difficult to move the house backwards, which would be really the only choice, backwards to uh, F Street if you moved it um, along the, the diagonal line that is the, uh, the property line that splits the two lots, that is. Um, you would you would immediately run into a very steep grade uh, on the south side of the house. Um, so I don't, I don't see that as really a much of a possibility. Um, if you rebuilt the p footprint of the house, given the setbacks uh, and the property line that was never vacated uh, between lots five and six, uh, you would have a substantially smaller uh, allowable structure than, than is, uh, what would be, I guess, considered substandard for the neighborhood. Um, so I, I, I believe that I am meeting uh, standard one um, in the sense that there you know, it's it's not an easily resolved issue. Um, it's and it's a 60-year-old issue. Um, so uh, and there has been no complaints about it from any neighbors that I know of over its uh, lifetime. Um, uh, moving on to, uh, I, I guess my my last comments would probably be mostly to one and two. Moving on to three, um, it, it, um, and speaking directly to the roof overbuild, um, I understand that there is an other option which would not require uh, lifting the roof, as it were, uh, in order to apply the insulation as I'm proposing. Um, however, I'd like to. Um, explain briefly how I got to this location uh, here before you. Um, I participated in the Home Energy Rebate Program, um, and uh, Dan Bagley uh, was my uh, auditor, and he recommended the very plans that I am now proposing to you. Uh, so I'd like to simply argue that this is something that ultimately the state of Alaska is recommending that I do to my house. Um, if you can interpret what the auditor recommends is what ultimately the state is recommending. Um, now, since um, I've ran into resistance realizing that this was a non-conforming structure, now, granted, I didn't know that beforehand, and maybe I should have. Anyways, um, it took me um, quite a bit of time last summer trying to work on these issues within the 18-month uh, period. Uh, that 18-month period is, is uh, was expired in, in April, so it's now too late for me to receive any benefit from the state program. Um, uh, why it took me a year to get to this point uh, is I don't fault the city um, more that uh, I guess I just met with a lot of resistance and was doing a lot of other things um, besides and um, decided that given the, the time frame to get a variance last summer, it really wasn't worth pursuing. I think I found out I needed a variance by in July. So I would have, you know, do the math, it would have been probably 
September before I would be able to meet before the Variance Board. Um, winter starts creeping in shortly thereafter. So, um, so uh, as for the other standards, I don't feel I need to speak to them given that um, uh, Mr. Barrett believes that I have met those standards. Um, I would simply like to say that uh, from a personal standpoint that I, I hope that you do grant this variance. I believe that this house is a historic structure um, that, that uh, though non-conforming, um, exhibits some of the character and charm of, of, of the old Anchorage town site that I think should be maintained. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Do any board members have questions for the petitioner? Mr. Fink. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is, is, the, um, is your house on the historic registry? No, it's not. Mr. Vig. What would be the, the um, consequences for you if this variance were not to be granted? How would that affect the property? Uh, the consequences would be that um, I would not be able to bring the house up to as high a grade of insulation. Um, I, I know that the general standard for, for insulation is around an R34. I'd like to bring it up quite a bit higher than that. Uh, it's my belief that um, an R34 standard is, is a pretty low standard given our extreme climate in Alaska. Um, I, I think I lean somewhat towards an environmental stance. Um, and I do believe that um, by increasing the insulation value, it, I, I don't know if I'm sure you are aware that uh, we do face a, you know, a gas situation in this, in this uh, city. We have only one source of natural gas. Should that be uh, interrupted, uh, we face serious problems in terms of electricity. So by doing this, I'm, I'm you know, helping make a, a step forward in, in decreasing Anchorage's um, need for natural gas. Beyond that, um, uh, by doing this, I would open up the attic as living space, as, as um, conditioned air space, which would allow uh, greater ability to store um, things. It's a small house. I don't have a garage, so I don't have a lot of storage space. Um, and um, the, uh, I, I kind of lost my train of thought on that, but um, so uh, the other option is to, pardon me, is to uh, insulate the attic uh, properly, uh, presumably with blown in uh, um, cellulose or something to that effect. Um, it's an old house. Um, there's old wiring. Um, I'd like to continue to be able to monitor that wi wiring, replace it as necessary um, by filling my attic with, you know, two feet of cellulose. That becomes very difficult to do. Um, so from from a building safety standpoint, from my opinion, uh, it's well worth uh, keeping that attic up you know, or making it open. And currently, it has very little insulation up there, um, as it is. So it's it's easy to see the where you'd need to go to make um, uh, repairs and such. Right now, um, it's it's bleeding a lot of a lot of uh, energy right now. So, so two points, I guess, to answer that is one from just a a wider perspective of the city and also for my own personal gain as in terms of storage and maintenance. So so it's is it correct that it's more of an energy upgrade project as it is a solution to a, a leaking roof? Uh, can you read for, I'm, I well, don't quite is, the, the project your roof the roofing is is intended to help your energy efficiency of the house, not because you have a, a leaking roof. That's correct. Water into your house. Yeah, that's correct. The, the, the roof does not currently leak. Any other board members have questions? Mr. Barrett? Uh, no questions, Mr. Chairman, but I'd like to go back and re answer your question and elaborate a little bit on standard one when you asked if um, 
there were other variances or similar encroachments in the neighborhood. I took a look at the file, got out my notes. Uh, the answer is no. However, there is an answer that relates to standard number one for the property immediately adjacent to Mr. Olson, the property on the north portions of lots five and six. That home has similar dimensional setbacks from the lot lines as Mr. Olson does, but where Mr. Olson has a 20-foot setback along F Street, the house on the north portions has their front yard as 14th Avenue, so they only have a five-foot setback along F. So uh, I, I believe I'd like to amend number one, standard one, to say that that should strongly be considered as, as a physical peculiarity of the property. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Olson, uh, for your uh, presentation. Um, is there anyone from the public wishing to testify? Seeing none, you do have about two and a half minutes left if there's anything else you'd like to like to share. Otherwise? Uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, I, I'd like to thank Mr. Barrett for bringing up uh, this recent, this latest comment in regards to the adjacent property. Um, it, you know, his his front yard is is on 14th, mine's on F. So um, he he gains by uh, just a just a, a consequence of 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 where his, his address is, um, which I couldn't do. I wouldn't be able to move my address to 14th. So. Um, I think that should should be considered as a as a reason to grant this variance that there is a somewhat there's a very similar structure uh, right next door that is um, filling the the space similar to mine and it is not considered non-conforming. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Okay. The public hearing is now closed, and with that, the matter now rests with the board. Uh, will a board member please uh, make a positive motion? Again, hand signals would, would work. Mr. Cars, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as uh, I believe the previous applicant said, in the spirit of wanting to get out and enjoy this uh, sunny evening, I'd like to make a motion um, and move with regard to case number 2011-065 that we grant a variance in the R2M district, a uh, variance from AMC 2140-045, yard requirements, which requires a 20 foot front yard setback from F Street and a five foot side yard setback between the lots five and six and from 2155-040 non-conforming structures to allow a new roof on the house which is an expansion of a non-conforming structure subject to staff recommendations one through four on pages nine and ten of the staff packet. Thank you, Mr. Cars. Uh, Ms. Williams, uh, have you seconded the motion? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cars, uh, please speak to your motion. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I intend to support this motion um, with respect to the seven standards. Um, the There exist exceptional or extraordinary physical circumstances of the subject pro property. Uh, we've uh, had... Um, the petitioner provide a, while well, it's personally um, performed, um, I was impressed with his hand drafting skills and um, as well as a picture picture on state page 46, I believe, of the staff packet that indicate that I do find that topography um, is, um, is a uh, physical circumstance of the lot that combined with the, as, as Mr. Barrett just uh, brought up in, in rebuttal time, the adjacent property to the north, their frontage uh, is 14th Avenue for front yard, while the petitioner, excuse me, while the petitioner's um, front yard is F Street. Um, 
for those reasons, I find that that standard is met. Um, I also concur that uh, with regard to standard two, that the that standard is met. Um, again, with there are physical um, circumstances uh, affecting the property. And I, I do disagree with staff, and I, I find that those are directly related to the need for the variance. Standard three, I, I, I find this is met as a whole for, for a number of, of, well, I find that it's met my reasoning while, while the individual um, issues that I bring up might not, might not make one think that this standard is met. I think as a whole they are. I've always wrestled with the, the timing of when a, a house is built. Um, this house was built in 1946, well before zoning, so the hardship is, is a result of the zoning that occurred after the house was built. Uh, we've heard from the, the applicant this evening that the view of the mountains may have also been um, in a reason for situating the the lot, the house on the lot and its configuration. And I could sure see in 1946 when there weren't a lot of other reasons um, to situate a house, that combined with the topography would be a, a pretty valid reason for for that. So I, I do find that uh, this hardship is not self-imposed self uh, and that this standard is met. Standard four, I concur with staff, the standard is substantially met, as well as standard five, six, and seven. Uh, I concur with staff's um, um, write up on those standards. So for those reasons, I intend to support the motion. Thank you, Mr. Carson. Ms. Williams, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, thank you. Um, Standard one, I agree that that is at least partially met um, due to the topography um, described and the um, situation of the house um, compared to the adjacent property on F Street versus on 14th Street. Um, standard two, I believe that's also at least um, partially met. Um, uh, it doesn't seem uh, that moving the house would be an option, again, due to the topography and in comparison um, to the rest of the, of the, um, or to the adjacent neighbor, um, it would be an extreme option um, to move the house. Um, standard three, I also believe that that is at least uh, partially met um, due to the historical circumstances um, described by Mr. Cars, and also again, um, I, I just don't see an option for them as far as uh, moving the house due to the, the topography that um, I described under standards one and two. Um, I believe that standard four is substantially met, agreeing with staff and Mr. Cars. Um, the encroachments have been in place for many, many years, and also uh, there doesn't appear to be any opposition from neighbors. Um, number uh, standard five, I also agree that that standard is substantially met um, due to the fact that it's a dimensional, not a use variance. Standard six, um, I also agree that that is substantially met. Um, I didn't see any issues um, brought up by any of the municipality agencies that, that reviewed this variance request. Um, and standard seven, I also um, agree that that's substantially met. Um, the variance um, is being requested um, to make a, a change to the house that's not changing the footprint um, at all. So I do believe that that's it's, it's the minimum uh, um, possible uh, variance request. So for all those reasons, I, um, I intend to support the variance request. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, any other, other board members like to discuss the motion? Okay. Um, I do intend to support the motion as well. Uh, for the reasons stated, I find that standard three is, is at least partially met, if not met, uh, based on the topography of the lot, and location, and other reasons for citing the, the building where it's currently located as discussed during the public hearing. Um, so again, I intend to support the motion. Okay, um, let's vote. Motion passes with seven votes in favor, 
Um, with that, I must read for the record one last time for the night. Every final decision of the board shall clearly state it on its face it is a final decision with respect to all issues involved in the case and that the parties have 30 days from the date of mailing or other distribution of the decision to file an appeal to the Superior Court. Uh, thank you, Mr. Olson. Have a good evening. All right. Are there any reports this evening? Mr. Cars. I don't have a report, just two, two statements. One, I'd like to compliment Mr. Patrick on his uh, choice of shirts and that in the future he and I will be, um, will be uh, coordinating our attire for every, every meeting. And uh, I don't want to steal Mr. Barrett's thunder, but I, I saw in the upcoming assembly uh, agenda we have some good news, I'm assuming. It sounds like a blast from the past. Mr. Dunham's thrown his hat in the his hat in the ring to be uh, on the zoning board. So uh, we'll, we'll, I'm done talking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mr. That, Vaughan. That, that habit. Admission of a blast from the past. Mm -hmm. um, very good. So it sounds like we may have eight members uh, in the near future. Correct. Uh, we don't expect any any opposition about Mr. Dunham. A little of his background, he served before. He's a former municipal permit clerk, so he'll be very good with the history of projects and so on. And Mr. Burkhart has volunteered to submit uh, his co-worker's name again to the mayor's office. Uh, give it another shot. Maybe the stars are in alignment or something. And um, just on a side note, Mr. Burkhart, for those of you who know him, is moving to San Diego. I guess it's too cold up here. I don't know. <laughs> I can't figure that one. Uh, I, I, I know Mr. Cars is not going to be here July 14th. Correct. Head count from everyone else as of tonight. Expect to be here. Okay, great. Right. Thank you. All right. Very good. Mr. Cars, enjoy your trip. Thank you. Thank it's you all. 103 degrees in Sacramento right now. So. <laughs> Speaking of which, let's go enjoy the, the rest of the sun. Thank you all. Have a good night. Meeting adjourned. Yeah.